From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And during our first half hour today, K-State's Dan O'Brien and Monty Vandeveer team up to discuss several items of current importance to you corn producers. The corn market's response to continued widespread planting delays. The crop insurance prevented planting provisions that you corn growers can consider as planting deadlines have either passed or are imminent, depending on where you are in Kansas. And the new wrinkle that ties into all of it, the just-announced USDA trade assistance for producers, which could influence one's decision on that prevented planting option. We'll cover it all with Dan and Monty next. And later on, on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp, plus more here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about seven tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You are tuned into the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. On the grain market scene, things are hopping with the announcement yesterday of the Trade Aid Package 2.0, as they're putting it, out of the USDA, and how that's going to factor into the markets. Moreover, the alternative that many producers may be contemplating now as they are continuing to fight adverse planting conditions to the point of possibly taking part in the prevented planting option of the crop insurance program. We'll cover all of that right here with two guests, agricultural economists for K-State Research and Extension. Dan O'Brien, as you know, is a grain market economist. And from the Southwest Research and Extension Center, Monty Vandeveer has joined us as well to enlighten us more on the prevented planting alternatives. Where to start? We'll go with you, Dan, first of all. Corn planting delays, they are front and center in the markets uh, and uh, soybeans as well. But staying with corn, you've worked up some new numbers that lend further perspective on those delays. Yes. On May the 19th, the USDA had released a uh, percent planted report. Now, there will be another one coming out uh, early part of next week to tell us what type of progress we've made in, in the fields since, uh, well, over the last week. But if you look at the top 18 states that the USDA monitors and take the percent planted in each of those states, do some calculations with harvested acres uh, and average yields, you you end up with some idea of the impact of the planting delays. So I, I think that it should be no surprise that if we had intended in the U.S. to plant according to the prospective plantings report in late March, intended to plant about 92.7, 92.8 million acres if we're 49% planted. As of May the 19th, then you've got about 45 million acres planted. And it's not as if we are not going to plant those acres. I think the relevant comparison is is where we would be if we were at average. At average, during this time, we'd be about 80% planted. So basically, we're about 31% behind. But what's at stake though, is uh, if we had rains that didn't allow us to get into the fields at all, uh, then, uh, gee whiz, we'd be looking at 45 million acres times about 175, 176 uh, bushels an acre, to be, to be kind, assuming everything, we had a great growing season. And uh, you'd be looking at, well, about half of 14 or 15 uh, billion bushels of, of corn. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. And in fact, the ramifications of that on the corn industry and the livestock industry, the ethanol industry would be so draconian, we would have sky high prices. Uh, you know, is it six? Is it seven dollars per bushel? I, I don't think that's going to happen. You know, I think we'll, we'll end up, well, and especially with, with some of the announcements today, there's an incentive to keep planting even if it's late. And so we're probably going to end up with 
uh, something closer to five or ten million acres short. So instead of uh, 92, 93 million acres, more like either 87 or 82 million acres. And uh, what I think we will have, though, rather than the 176 bushels per acre that we'd seen with the late planting towards the back end of, of these planting windows and into the prevented planting crop insurance uh, late planting time frames and again that and that's the incentive we see in these announcements on preventive planning and and, and and create assistance instead of 176 are we 172 are we 170 or or even less so I, I think that if you start plugging in five to ten million acres planted less times about at least four or five bushels per acre less yield because of the lateness of all these activities then instead of this 15 billion bushel projection that that we'd seen the USDA come out with in in their May WASDE report for this coming marketing year, then you're looking at closer to 13.9 or or 13.1 billion bushels. And, you know, you run that through supply-demand balance sheets, and at those levels, you have to ration usage. You know, because you can't can't go to zero on corn stocks. We need need some just to... uh, insure ourselves from from having to just shut down industry so we with that we just we raise prices to ration usage but you do have ending stocks and instead of 2.4 2.5 billion bushels as the usda had initially projected you're down to 1.4 or 1.5 or that's at the 5 million acre less projection and here again and we've got a, a, a long ways to go just to get to that at the 10 million acre lower number and lower yields, again, 170, 172, you're around 13 billion bushels or less. Ending stocks, 1 to 1.1 billion. Stocks to use below 10, significantly more like 7.5 to 8. And uh, prices, you're getting closer to like 4.5 to $5. And if you get to the 10 million acre cutback and lower yields, then you're looking actually you'd be significantly above 550. <laughs> and I, I hesitate to say where you'd be, but if we're really that short, if we have 13 or below billion bushels, then, uh, then we, have, we will have had a market reset and we'll have had uh, pretty strong price rationing that will have had to go on. In fact, it would roll over and affect the wheat market in that for wheat, uh, you know, we've got large carryovers, not a lot of wheat feeding. Well, if we were that short of corn... We, we would be impelled to keep livestock feeding going and some bioenergy uses. And you would take a good chunk down on the wheat ending stocks. You'd affect that market. You would uh, affect the focus of the grain sorghum market. You know, the first, first substitute would be feeding a lot more, a lot more grain sorghum. We would, and probably what, what suffers in, in these more catastrophic short crop scenarios is probably more of an entrenched focus on domestic use and really a paring down of what we do for exports. In fact, the last one or two times we've had shorter, tighter crops, that's what we've done. We, we basically protected in-house because of logistics, the most affordable uses, i.e., again, feeding in industrial use, and have uh, seen most of the cutback come on the export side. Mm-hmm. So, you know, really a question I would have is coming up to the June WASDE report, uh, not that far away, how proactive and aggressive will the USDA be in showing some of these acreage potential cutbacks and, and changes and the balance sheet and price expectations uh, in June before they've been out in the fields and measured anything? So lots of things going on. But spinning around all of these added variables, Dan, that have led to the uncertainty here as if we needed more of that. And we will bring Monty in in just a few moments to talk about one of those, that is the prevented planting option that corn growers may well be eyeing. But the next two or three weeks, as all of this sifts out, may lend to some tremendous volatility in the markets or has that potential, doesn't it? Well, uh, yes. Uh, here yesterday with when the uh, prevented planting numbers came out, after several days moving higher, you know, fairly strongly higher, not wildly, but moving upwards in the corn futures markets with that USDA pronouncement, which looks like, from what we can read before seeing the details, that's trying to encourage acreage planting. Mm-hmm. You saw the corn market go down about four to five cents. Four to five cents is kind of noise. <laughs> it's it is not a ch- it, it's it's sentiments. So uh, 
that next several weeks, it's a weather market. You know, it, a weather market in terms of planting, planting pressures, and we will we'll see where we go from there. But as you say, volatility uh, and uncertainty right now is, uh, is the name of the game, unlike we ever would have dreamed of in January and February. Right. One other thought, when you look at, again, with focus on corn, uh, the crop insurance planning price, the average for these corn futures, these 19 futures during February was $4 even. Uh, we had gotten up to uh, the highest price here in the last several days, about four twelve, four thirteen. Here yesterday, uh, the market had fallen off about five cents, about four oh eight thereabouts for the lead contract anyway. And I, I think, no, pardon me, lead contract lower than that, but D's corn is about four oh eight. So this is kind of the the framework that we're operating within. Uh, again, so for revenue insurance tools. Four dollars the price, and here we've come up above that here recently. I guess what I'll be watching uh, in the next next week or so will be to watch that that Dees corn contract and see what it does when it comes back down to that four dollar level, uh, given all the uncertainty that's there. And here we still have a tremendous amount of, of corn acreage not planted, and we're basically, as of May nineteenth, about forty million acres short. <laughs> I, I think with the ingenuity and drive and motivation of U.S. farmers, we're going to plant still a, a lot of that cropland. So here we put these uh, scenarios together where we're down 5 and 10 million acres. We're going to have to have weather cooperation even to get to that. But I, I, I think we probably will, given, given the motives in hand. But even if we get to that, we're still, you know, instead of 15 billion bushels, we're down to 13. And uh, you've got uh, tighter stocks, higher prices, et cetera. The market may or may not be quick to acknowledge that. But regardless of what the futures do, the cash markets are going to have to go grab grain if things get tight. And that, so we might see more of a later price response based on what the market's demanding as opposed to what we're fearful of up front. We need to take a quick break here, and we want to continue our conversation not only with K-State's Dan O'Brien, but with K-State's Monty Vandeveer about that prevented planting alternative for corn growers and some key things to be aware of. And as well, we'll talk more about the USDA's announcement on the basic framework of the trade assistance package, the second go-round that they announced yesterday. All of that's still to come. After these moments away, you're listening to... Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Agriculture Today returns now and Mike Side once more with us. K-State Research and Extension Agricultural Economists Dan O'Brien and Monty Vandeveer. As we're talking about the corn market, the USDA's trade assistance package, details of that which were announced yesterday. But right now, we want to get into information vital to producers still struggling to find any sort of window to get their corn planted. And that door is closing very swiftly now. The option under the crop insurance coverage that most, if not all, corn growers take out of prevented planting. We'll look at that now and what producers need to know about that with Monty Vandeveer. Give us the basics here, Monty. Most growers should be fairly familiar with those now, but what do they need to have in mind right away? Well, there's two terms I think we need to understand just right off the bat. The first is called the final planting date. And that's the last date on which you can get full crop insurance coverage uh, on your corn. And there's three different zones in Kansas. Southeast Kansas is May 15th. Central Kansas and Northeast Kansas is May 25th. 
and then western Kansas is May 31st. So we've already passed the date for southeast Kansas, and the other two dates are coming up quickly. So you can still insure your crop for planting after those dates, but you won't have the full coverage. So final planting date, that's that's the first key term. Second key term is uh, what they call the late planting period. And that's the next 20 days following uh, the final planting date. So you can still get insurance coverage on your corn crop during that time, but the coverage is going to decline by 1% per day each day late that the uh, acres gets planted. So probably the biggest thing we need to tell producers out there is if you think you're going to be in this late planting situation, talk to your agent right away. You've got several options you can uh, choose from, but you need to be in contact with them and be talking about all the requirements that you have to meet along the way. Make sure that that you're uh, uh, satisfying all the responsibilities under your policy. That late planting period, that's becoming a focal point now as we are past the final planting date in a part of Kansas. A large part will be past that date by the end of tomorrow. They have that 20-day window. That puts those dates somewhat down the road here, but June 20th, that would be the last date effective in Kansas. That would be, uh, yeah, the the last date you could go. The farmers, I think that the biggest choice they're looking at here on the corn side is going to be, okay, if I decide not to plant at all, uh, I get a full prevented planting payment. Mm -hmm. And if I decide to plant my corn late, one big question is going to be, how much of a yield loss am I going to have to sustain as I, as I have to wait and wait and wait? As my expected corn yields goes down, that makes that late planting look less attractive. This is requiring quick math on the part of a, a producer here, and, and we'll bring in the other element that would be that potential for trade aid assistance. There are some other variables we might want to talk about with regard to the end of that LLP. One can plant that acreage to a cover crop instead of the intended crop, and there are some allowances there, right? Uh, yes. If you decide to go the full prevented planting payment, you can uh, leave those acres idle, or you can go ahead and put a cover crop on it. So it really depends which way you want to go, whether the costs tilt one way or the other, or if you're looking for some other soil benefits. Uh, I think the big wild card on not planting in anything at all, though, came out under the new uh, trade package. Uh, The incentive there seems to be uh, they want acres to get planted to one thing or another. And in fact, there's a quote of uh, the chief economist of USDA, Rob Johansson, said, you'll not receive payments if you do not plant. So that immediately makes this full prevented planting payment and uh, leave a fallow or just a cover crop, that makes that, I think, probably going to look a lot less attractive. Mm -hmm. And it appears that maybe the late planting option, if one can get in the field, becomes more attractive because you potentially would get part of your insurance indemnity. By the same token, you uh, could possibly remain eligible for this new market assistance. So <laughs> there's right. a there's, lot going on here. There's there's so many moving parts. Uh, you have uh, where do you think prices are going to go? How big is the payment going to be? Uh, how much of a yield loss would I sustain by planting late? There's so many variables in the air. It, uh, producers really have to sit down and, and think about this carefully. Dan? Monty, you and uh, Lucas Haig in one of the past year or so have done some, some work on late planting of corn where you, where you really scrutinized how, how late you can plant the crop and still have a good likelihood of coming to full maturity and uh, with, with no problems. And those dates don't necessarily match up uh, in the western part of the state anyway with, with, with the crop insurance final dates. Right. You can still plant a bit late, but the the expected yield loss may not match that 1% per day right, right. rate. And so don't necessarily go by that rule when you're looking at what yield you might expect. Mm-hmm. Have to toss into the fray here the likely production costs if one plants late under the late planting provision. And again, whether that will detract from the potential returns to that option. 
Well, if you uh, if you don't plant the crop at all, you're saving a pretty big chunk of your uh, corn production costs. On the other hand, that's if you go ahead and uh, spend the production costs and you get a crop that's nearly normal, they, it may still be worth it. So it's it's hard to judge unless you're plugging in particular numbers. The bigger that yield decline is, though, the less attractive that later planting becomes. But that's that was before we learned about the trade package. It, it would seem that... Gosh, it'd be nice to know within the next several days how much money we're talking about. Right. <laughs> so that so that you can enter that in with more than just a guess of what it might be. And if it's X dollars per acre, well, then we can weigh things economically in, in that decision. So I, I don't know how soon these numbers will come out. But gosh, the sooner the better in terms of our decision. And the pivotal one would be that single county payment rate. Yes. Because that's what this will be triggering uh, and uh, then multiplied by the farm's total planted acres in 2019, hence, again, the incentive to plant to be eligible. So once that is known, that helps a producer sort through this a little a little better anyway. Yeah. Monty, you do. We want to mention this because its details are critical here for an individual producer. You have put together a write-up that's available on the agmanager.info website on prevented planting options for Kansas corn growers in 2019, in which you do cite several what-if scenarios. And that would be a great read for producers trying to get a handle on all of those moving parts, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, It'll be on Ag Manager, and I hope people can uh, check it out. We try to explain, first of all, the different options that are out there, and we also provide several links to uh, RMA rules that uh, will give farmers a little bit more guidance, too. We've already mentioned, what, I guess three of the options. The first one is don't plant anything and leave, leave a fallow, and in that case, you get the full corn prevented planting payment. You can uh, get the full prevented planting payment and use the cover crop, or you can plant your corn sometime late, probably in the late planting period, uh, in which case you still have coverage, but it's going to be declining. The other two options are, first is to go to a completely different crop. And so uh, one might be looking at soybeans for uh, different parts of Kansas. So you can plant soybeans sometime in the late planting period, but you don't get any of the corn prevented planting payment. Okay, And then the last option is to wait until the end of the late planting period for corn. So that's 20 days after the final planting date. And then go ahead and plant your soybeans or your other second crop. In that case, you get 35% of the corn prevented planting payment. You still have to pay 35% of the premium, but you can go ahead and, and plant that second crop. Should mention here, though, that we're starting at that 20 day later point, we're starting to get close to late planting dates for it's soybeans. Be. So have to watch that really carefully. By the structure of this. MFP 2.0 announcement. I don't know that it completely changes the game, but it takes the pressure off to be forced to plant one crop to get a payment. It I, almost has the flavor of the freedom to farm approach that created a new farm bill many years ago. And really, that's that's okay. If people can retain the option of, of planting the most economically viable crop according to what market prospects are, then that's, I I think, ultimately a better situation than being forced to plant a particular thing because the program forced you to. Things are happening on the corn market front with these allied issues, that being the prevented planting option and the trade aid announcements. So, You, too, undoubtedly will stay on top of all this and uh, be posting information on Ag Manager as it comes forth, and we will talk with you again soon. Thanks, gentlemen, for coming over. Thanks, Eric. Along with us to hash through all of this, Dan O'Brien and Monty Vandeveer, agricultural economists with K-State Research and Extension. And Agriculture Today will be back after this break. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. 
For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And we move ahead now with today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. And the USDA will provide up to $16 billion in efforts to help U.S. agriculture impacted by unjustified regulatory tariffs on U.S. agricultural products and other trade disruptions, the agency announced yesterday. As with that initial farmer aid effort announced last year, the program announced yesterday will have three components, payments to producers, commodity purchases, and trade promotion efforts. Those first payments will go out in late July or early August, according to the USDA. A second round of payments potentially in late fall to November, and a third installment would potentially come in 2020. The market facilitation program for 2019 will be done via Commodity Credit Corporation Charter Act Authority and will be up to $14.5 billion. Producers of alfalfa hay, barley, canola, corn, cotton, oats, sorghum, soybeans, sunflowers, and wheat, among other commodities, commodities will receive a payment. Now, the payments will be based once again on a single county rate multiplied by a farm's total plantings to those crops in aggregate this year. Those per acre payments are not dependent on which of those crops are planted in 2019 and therefore will not distort planting decisions. That's the theory behind it. And the total payment eligible plantings cannot exceed total 2018 plantings. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue explains how the trade mitigation program will was developed. So our team at USDA reflected on what worked well last year and what we could have done better when we ran last year's program to most effectively redesign this program to support farmers over the longer term. That being said, frankly, all of this would have been moot if China had acted appropriately and uh, and fairly in many of the areas regarding intellectual property theft and non-tariff barriers that they have put up for many years. Now, dairy producers will receive a per hundredweight payment on production history under this new aid. Swine producers will receive payment based on hog and pig inventory for a later specified time frame. More details will be provided by the USDA in terms of what those payment levels will be. By the way, the state director of the Farm Service Agency for Kansas, David Shim, will be joining us right here on the broadcast next week to walk through the specifics with us as they come together. The plan also includes spending $1.4 billion under a food purchase and distribution program similar to the program that spent $703 million under last year's setup that will be used for buying fruits, vegetables, some processed foods, beef, pork, poultry, and dairy products that will be distributed by the USDA to food banks nationally. And the USDA also will set aside another $100 million dedicated to developing and growing more export markets for farm products the USDA just recently announced $200 million for checkoff programs and other groups that will go specifically for expanding export markets by those organizations. Meantime, Congress provided $3 billion in disaster aid for producers under a disaster aid package overwhelmingly approved yesterday by the Senate. The House could approve that bill on a voice vote today, depending on whether leaders of both parties agree. The White House has said that President Trump has agreed to sign the bill. It includes over $3 billion to pay for farmer losses from disasters last year and this year. That is expected to cover Midwest farmers who lost ground and other resources this spring during the flooding along the Missouri River Basin. The disaster legislation also waives adjusted gross income caps for producers under the market facilitation program. That is a move that opens up the trade aid to a larger group of higher income producers. 
Well, a student from South Central Kansas who aspires to great things in agricultural science is the recipient of a prestigious scholarship from Kansas Wheat. It honors a Kansas farmer who was a pioneer in wheat industry leadership. Marsha Boswell has the details on this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Marsha? With a passion for agriculture and research, the 2019 recipient of the Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship is Georgia Elliott of Pratt, Kansas. This $500 scholarship will help Elliott pursue her degree in biology with an emphasis in botany at Fort Hayes State University, where she has already been taking courses through the Kansas Academy of Math and Science. Elliot says this scholarship is ultimately allowing me to pursue the agricultural research I want to do as a career. She has already been active on the agricultural research scene. Elliot is involved with studying the effects of toxins like ethanol, lactic acid, and sulfide on various crops around Kansas. The goal is to see how much of these toxins the plants can be exposed to before they cause damage to the plant. She is working to have a publication that would summarize the research published this summer. Raised in rural Kansas, Elliot knew agriculture was just part of the fiber of her being. She grew up in a farming family, as did her friends. She wanted to be a part of agriculture and has a passion for research in science. Elliot says, I want to see what my research does for the community because a farming community is what I grew up in. Before deciding on agricultural research, she explored various avenues to try and find her niche. Elliot obtained her certified nurse aid and certified medication aid from Pratt Community College before and during her involvement with the Kansas Academy for Math and Sciences. The KAMS program is a difficult and competitive program for high school juniors and seniors from across the state of Kansas. Students must have a high GPA from their high school and must meet the ACT and SAT requirements. Additionally, those applying to be in the program must be involved in activities in and out of the classroom. About 20 students are selected to be in the program. Elliot has completed a variety of challenging and higher-level courses at Fort Hayes State University, such as engineering, physics, calculus 1 and 2, and organic chemistry through this program. She has already gotten involved on campus, serving as the vice president of the Chemistry Pre-Professional Club, president of the National Residential Hall Honorary, and as a member of the Honors College. Because of her excellence in the classroom, drive to finding answers to agriculture's questions, and her involvement on campus, Georgia Elliott is highly deserving of this scholarship. The Herb Clutter Memorial Scholarship was established through a fund in memory of Herbert W. Clutter, a farmer from Holcomb and the first president of the National Association of Wheat Growers. The history of the Kansas Association of Wheat Growers and the Kansas Wheat Commission is enriched with the memory and lasting leadership of Clutter and his family. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Many thanks, Marsha. Standing by to cover the Kansas agricultural weather scene with us, K-State's Mary Knapp. She's in next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Now for you on Agriculture Today, our weekly visit with K-State climatologist Mary Knapp on Kansas agricultural weather. We know what the featured topic is, Mary, that's no mystery, but you have in hand from the Weather Data Library day-by-day rainfall numbers for the month of May, and those are striking, if nothing else. Right. What I did was I took the Kokoraz reports, and Kokoraz, remember, is the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail, and Snow Network, where volunteers go out with standard gauges, make the measurements, and report. And for the 24 days going through this morning, and again, not all of the reports are necessarily in yet, um, we have had one day 
out of the 24 where the average across the state was zero. One. And even on one, and even on that day, somebody had at least four tenths of an inch of rainfall. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't completely dry even then. Noteworthy, we have had two days where the rain average has been over an inch and a half. On the 8th of May, we averaged 1.76 across the network, and that was out of 707 reports. Hmm. So, again, a lot of observers reporting and average pretty high. And the more recent one on the 21st, the average was 2.14 inches, and that's 682 reports that got that in there. We've had a few observers that weren't able to get to their gauges to get the reports in. But again, substantial number of observers and lots of rain to go with that. Our biggest single rainfall reports on the 8th, we had one observer near Rose Hill that reported 9.32 inches. On our more recent rain, the max was 7.27 inches. So, again, we've had a lot of rain and the attendant problems that go along with it. Even in the Northwest, which has been missing out on a lot of these systems, is running for the month to date, is running at 3.36 inches, which is 142% of normal. The southeast, which I imagine there are people that are beginning to think of building an arc. Boy, isn't that the truth. Their average for the division is 12.43 inches, which is more than three times what they would normally expect for the month through the 22nd. And again, that doesn't include anything that fell yesterday or overnight, and we know that there have been quite a few reports. Our mesonet station down there has over two inches of rain for the last 24 hours. So that adds to um, the total that we're already seeing. So yeah, water is definitely an issue. And uh, that is true across the rest of the state from northwest to southeast, those extremes, but everybody else is well above normal monthly. Right. Again, there may be a few pockets where they haven't seen quite as much, but Even in, again, the Northwest, where we have still a tiny sliver of abnormally dry conditions, the major complaint is the difficulty to get out and get any of the field work accomplished. That's been further compromised, if you will, by the temperatures. The May temperatures have averaged below normal. Despite our warm spell last week, we're still looking at between two degrees cooler than normal in the southeast to as much as five degrees cooler than normal in the northwest. That's slowed any kind of crop development. It has also meant less evaporation, so these soils are not drying out in the day or two of sunshine that is shaping up. I have heard some reports that people were able, again last week during that sunny, warm, dry spell, to get some of the hay put up, but haying is behind average. Planting of corn and soybeans are behind average, and we're looking at a fairly significant delay in all of our spring activities. Most everyone, Mary, is eager for a change, but nothing dramatic is in the immediate outlook. It's largely more of the same for a few more days. Right. The 6 to 10 and 8 to 14 day outlooks are both favoring wetter than normal. Again, we're moving into our wet season, so wetter than normal means significant rain is possible. The June outlook, which was released last week, favors wetter and cooler than normal for the entire state. If we go out a little bit further and look at the summer composition, the June, July, and August outlook, which was also released last week, favors wetter and cooler than normal conditions statewide. Note on that summer outlook, that is the three-month average, and if we had a significantly wet June, we could have a dry July and August and still verify that forecast. It doesn't look like it's going to be one of those patterns where we switch abruptly from rainy and cool to warm and dry, 
But one of the problems that producers will face, and there's not much they can do about it, but it's a difficulty that they may encounter, is that because conditions are so wet as the crops are being seeded and germinating this spring, root development is going to be much, much less than it would typically be. That means that the crops will be more vulnerable to a relatively short dry spell. There could be moisture just a couple of inches down, but the roots are not going to be into that, so it's going to create difficulties. The other difficulty with that poor root development will be that fertilizer uptake, nutrient uptake, will be compromised as well. So you could have very good nutrient profiles in your soils, but still see signs of nutrient deficiencies in your crop. We are just about to embark on the Memorial Day weekend. You wanted to part with one thought for folks as they go out. They better check those conditions first. Right. We're likely to see rains on and off this weekend. This is the kind of setup where we've got that battling front that's draped just to our south. If that moves north a little bit, we could be on the firing line for um, severe, even tornadic events. And the Storm Prediction Center has an increased alert for parts of central and eastern Kansas through the weekend. Mary, enjoy your weekend. Thank Thank you. Thanks, Eric. You as well. Mary Knapp with us, climatologist, K-State Research and Extension. That is our time for today, and we bid you a good Memorial Day weekend as well. Meantime, Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.